Dr. Escott, I thought it'd be nice to just have a little chat with you before you teach so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Sure. So how has your trip been in Malaysia so far? I see that you put on a little bit of weight. <laughs> <laughs> have you been eating too much? <laughs> Always. Uh, yeah, it's been great. I've uh, had a really great time so far. I've met a lot of fantastic people and uh, in, been enjoying the warm weather. It's winter back in Sydney and I love the heat. And I've uh, been enjoying the spicy food as well and um, being hosted by many of you, including my new friend, Jerome. Thanks. Yesterday uh, at the prelude <laughs> sermon... What? What? <laughs> we hang out. <laughs> Uh, at the prelude sermon, you shared that you found the Old Testament to be very fascinating, and that's how you became interested in it. So did you struggle in your reading of the Old Testament, and what helped you just kind of get into it a lot more? Uh, yeah, so well, when I first, from, from when I was a young Christian, I became a Christian when I was an early teenage, young teenager, uh, I always struggled with the connection between the gospel and forgiveness of sins and what that meant for how I lived my life as a Christian. And part of that involved the question of the place of the law yeah. for me in my life and uh, of God's law in the Old Testament. And so from when I was a young Christian, I had a lot of questions about how to read the Old Testament. And what was the second part? What helped you? What helped me? Yeah. Um, I just stuck at it, was one. Uh, but when I was in my early university, I, actually, I think I would have been late high school, I read Graham Goldsworthy's Gospel and Kingdom. Okay. And uh, it really helped me to understand. It's just a, just a short little book. It really helped me to understand how the Old Testament and the New Testament fit together and how I can uh, read it as a whole. Now, that means that as I go into each individual part of the Old Testament, I've got something to hang, and hang, on, hang those bits on so I can make sense of the part in relation to the whole. Um, I think they've got it at the back, though it's, it's part of a trilogy, so it looks really fat. Don't worry about the other two ones, just read the middle one. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, read it all. But the best, the place to start is Gospel and Kingdom. Yeah. You may win it on the final night. You oh. never know. Not that he said it, okay? Uh, after all these years of studying the Old Testament, uh, this might be a big question, but how has it impacted your life? Uh, yeah, so I thought about this before, and I can't remember what I was going to say, but I'll just tell you what comes into my head now. <laughs> um, well, one is that it, um, it gave me a big picture of God a very uh, rich and deep picture of God as our creator, mm. uh, as the one who is holy, uh, and, and the one who is gracious. Now, of course, the New Testament shows us that picture of God. One of the things I love about the Old Testament is that it's so much longer than the New Testament, and there is just a, a lot in there about God as well. So it just really filled out, has filled out my picture of God, and so in my relating to Him... I think I have a, a better sense than of who he is. It's, it's cha and cha shaped the way that I pray, especially the Psalms, uh, more recently in life. And uh, I think one of the beautiful things about the Bible is that it doesn't just give us information, uh, but it also gives us... Uh, sorry, it's not just God speaking to us, but it's also God giving us words to speak back to him. Mm. And so it's really shaped my prayers. And thirdly, oh, I read the book of Ecclesiastes when I was at university, and it convinced me that I should go into full-time Christian ministry. Uh, I don't think that it will necessarily convince everyone to do that, or if that's the message to everyone, but that's what it said to me at that time in my life. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Escott. Now, after the talk, we will have some Q&A. You can ask him any question even the question about how did Ecclesiastes encourage you to do full-time paid ministry yeah. or anything on biblical theology or anything on the material tonight. Uh, please send in your questions by scanning the QR code on the screen. The outline for tonight's talk is available on GGF's website. So just go to the uh, conference page, go to the tab Downloads. Every night we will upload the conference outline. Dr. Escott, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. All right, well, as we come to consider this topic together, let's pray. Uh, 
Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us in the dark, but that you have revealed yourself to us through your scriptures and through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now that as we come to look at this together, by your Spirit, would you illuminate our hearts, uh, would you give us clear minds and help us to learn more about you and your word so we might love you more. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What the world really needs now is good news. Every time I look around, I open social media, or I read the news, we get plenty of bad news. And it just seems like, especially in the last couple of years, it's just been full of bad news. Disease, war in the Ukraine, climate change, shifting world powers and, and political climate. It feels like everywhere we look, there's bad news. And some days I have to stop looking at the news just so I can just calm down a little bit. I don't become overwhelmed by things. What I really want to be able to do is open up my news feed and see good news. I want to see peace in the Ukraine. I want to see new medical breakthroughs. I want to see political parties and nations being reconciled, working together for the common good. But instead, there's so much bad news. But if we're not getting bad news, then we seem to be getting so much advice. Advice on how to make things better. We get this from all over the place. In social media and even uh, from our churches and from our friends. Are you in economic hard times? Well, here's some advice on how to invest smarter and build your wealth. Are you unhealthy Have you eaten too much Malaysian food? (laughs) Here's how to lose weight and have the perfect body. Slow career. Here's how to work harder and have your perfect job. Are you spiritually dry? Then here's advice on how to be spiritually fulfilled and to win God's favor. The problem with advice is that while it can make small differences here and there, It never really fixes things. And we can just hear so much advice that it can become so overwhelming. We don't know where to start, and it just becomes too much. And so that's what makes the Christian gospel so important and so urgent. Because it is good news for the world. It's good news that is real, a legitimate answer to the bad news to the problems in the world. And it's good news that actually makes a difference. And it's not just those small little things that we can't put into practice. This is a, a kind of a sort of a strange good news because it begins with bad news. It tells us the true extent and depth of our problem. You know, as bad as all the bad news I talked about is, Those things, they're symptoms of a deeper issue, that our world is alienated from God and suffering from the effects of sin, of evil forces in the world, and of God's judgment. But instead of giving us impossible advice, the good news is that God has rescued us from our sin, from his judgment, and the fallen world. And he gives us real hope by his Son and his Spirit. And instead of hollow advice, the gospel then issues forth an instruction and wisdom on how to live well in light of the gospel. And so this gospel is what makes Christianity so distinctive and so powerful and so necessary for us and for our our world. Now this week we're going to be continuing to think about the gospel And in particular, we're going to talk about the gospel in the Old Testament. Now, when I say gospel and Old Testament, many of you might think, well, what could the Old Testament possibly have to do with the gospel? Sometimes God in the Old Testament looks very different to the God that we know in Jesus. A few years ago, the British atheist Richard Dawkins uh, Put it like this, this is a memorable quote. I had to look up some of these words. I can assure you they're all bad. 
The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character of all fiction, jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, inf- infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniac, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Gosh, that's a mouthful. Now, Dawkins doesn't like Jesus much either, but he hates especially the God of the Old Testament. Now, he puts it really strongly, but I think he is the extreme version, captures the kind of things that, that people around us and that even we could potentially think about God in the Old Testament. The idea that it is weird and outdated, that it's pre-Christian and so maybe even dangerous. It really does look like sometimes the Old Testament is just full of bad news and bad advice. But my goal this week is to take you on a journey to see that the Old Testament is good news and that the good news of the gospel is actually... a at the heart of the Old Testament. But tonight we need to find our bearings. And so I want to address two questions this evening. And the first is, what is the gospel anyway? When we talk about the gospel, when we read gospel in the New Testament, what does it mean? And then when we've established what the gospel is, the second question to ask is, how can we see the gospel in the Old Testament? In what way does it appear in the Old Testament? So, two questions tonight. What is the gospel and how can we see it in the Old Testament? So, first, what is the gospel? Well, to to begin answering this question, I want us to begin with the gospel accounts of Jesus. And I want to start with the shortest, punchiest gospel, the gospel of Mark. Now, remember there are four gospels, these autobiography... uh, No, they're not autobiographies, are they? These biographies of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Uh, Matthew and Luke, they begin with the familiar stories from Christmas. But the Gospel of Mark is a little different. Jesus bursts onto the scene, preaching, healing, calling disciples. And it's a complete whirlwind. But first, we have a short and very powerful opening title. And so here is Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now I want to zoom in and spend a little bit of time on just this sentence because it tells us a few very significant things about the gospel, especially as it unfolds through Mark. First, it says that the gospel of Jesus Christ begins here with this narrative story. Now, when we talk about the gospel, it's co- I think it can be common for us to talk about it in simple statements, uh, propositions, gospel theology. You know, the gospel is forgiveness of sins. The gospel is Jesus died for me. The gospel is hope for the world. Now, of course, that is, it's, that is right a right way to speak about the gospel. But here, the gospel begins with a story, with the story of Jesus Christ. Now, biblical theology, which is what we're dealing with this week, seeks to listen listen closely to what the Bible says about God and the world and His relationship, His saving relationship with the world. And it seeks to listen to it closely on its own terms. And one of the most significant terms of the, of the Bible, the new, Old and New Testament together, is that it is an unfolding story of God's work in the world, for His world and for His people. And so that's why we're going to spend so much time talking about this story of the Bible and the stories within it, like the Gospel of Mark which gives us the story of what Jesus has done. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, means that the gospel begins with this story. 
Second, the second thing to say about this sentence is that it introduces us to the word gospel. Now, I've already been talking about it, and I've been speaking about it as good news, and that's a pretty good definition for gospel. But what exactly is good news? What is gospel in this context in Mark? Well, I want to explain this from two angles. And the first context is in the context of the Roman Empire. When an original listener or reader of the Gospel of Mark heard the beginning of the Gospel, one of the things they would immediately think of is the Roman Emperor. This is Caesar Augustus, who reigned around the time that Jesus was born. Jesus came at the time of the Roman Empire, when the Romans ruled the world, and the Roman Empire was the largest and greatest empire that the world had ever seen up until that point. And the Romans were ruled by their great and powerful emperor, or Caesar. And in the eyes of the Romans, the emperor was a god. And across the empire, whenever an heir to the emperor was born, or whenever he came of age or came to the throne, they sent out an announcement of a gospel, a good news The gospel in this Roman Empire context was that the emperor would bring salvation, a new age of peace, of concord, of abundance on earth. The emperor was the saviour sent by the gods to stop war and bring order in the world through the mighty Roman Empire. But the other way of thinking about the gospel, as a reader of the gospel of Mark, as they read it, they they would have thought of the Roman Empire, but they would have thought of something else, something much older. And it's from the prophet Isaiah. Now have a look at the next verse in Mark chapter 1. This is Mark chapter 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now, this quote is actually a mix from a few different places in the Old Testament, but it's mostly from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Now, most of the book of Isaiah, the prophet preaches judgment. The nation of Israel had turned its back on God, and so God had turned his back on the nation. Now, for all of the life of God's people, God was incredibly patient and gracious. And we'll, we'll come back again and again to this story of Israel, but just for a very quick run through of God's patience and graciousness to them. You know, he chose them to be holy in his treasured possession. He saved them from slavery in Egypt and oppression there. He gave them their own land and gave them everything they needed. He gave them great kings who were wise and wealthy and victorious. And he lived among them. He he lived in their midst, in the middle of them, in his temple. And they had every physical and spiritual blessing. But despite all this, God's people Israel were unfaithful to God. He gave them good laws and rules to obey, but they repeatedly disobeyed. He told them they needed to worship him alone and no other gods But they repeatedly worshipped other gods. And so they dishonoured God and they were guilty before him. And so at the time of of Isaiah the prophet, God had had enough. And so he announced judgment on them. The first part of Isaiah tells how the the great superpower, Assyria, had come down from the north that God had ordained that they would do this, that they, this mighty foreign nation would come and wipe out the northern parts of Israel. And they did that, and they threatened Jerusalem, the capital city in the south. And Isaiah also warns the Jerusalemites there in the south, and he says, turn back to God now, and you will be saved. But they don't listen. So God sends now, not the Assyrians, he now sends the Babylonians who destroy their mighty city, take away their supposedly strong kings, destroys their temple, and takes them into a harsh foreign land. Israel rejected God, 
And so God rejected them. That is the message of much of the book of Isaiah. But in chapter 40 of Isaiah, God turns back to his people. A messenger, the prophet Isaiah, stands up and announces a gospel, a good news to Jerusalem. Your God is coming to save you. Now, let me read just from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare has, is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. And every mountain and hill made low, the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places made a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is a message of comfort, that God is here for his people. A message of forgiveness. God is forgiving their sin and rebellion. And a message of freedom. God is restoring them to their land. No more exile in foreign lands. God is bringing them back to him. And then in verse 9, a little further on, Isaiah calls this message good news or gospel. Go on up high to a mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold, your God. The gospel for Isaiah is that their shepherd king is here. He will gently gather his people as a shepherd gathers his sheep and will lead them into new life. They will be his people. He will be their God, worshipping together. So Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel this is it. According to the Romans, it's the gospel about the arrival of the Roman Empire to bring peace to the world. But according to Isaiah, the gospel is about the arrival of the Lord to bring salvation to his people. And so this good news of salvation definitely does not come from the Romans. But it, but it isn't even one that just comes from God because it comes through this human person, Jesus Christ. Christ, the Son of God. And so when Mark says, this is a gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, he's saying, no, the Roman Empire, the Roman Emperor is not the Saviour. Jesus Christ is the Saviour. The Empire isn't the way to peace. Jesus Christ is the one to, way to peace. The Emperor isn't the King. Jesus Christ is the King. He is the Lord, the King of Israel, the King of the world, come to save his people and renew his creation. He will bring peace, abundance, and life. And when Mark says that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's also saying, in Jesus, God is here, just as Isaiah promised. The shepherd king, the Lord, has come in this man, Jesus Christ. God will reign as king through him. God will forgive their sins through him. Through him, God will bring salvation for his people and lead them to freedom. And so in this man, Jesus Christ, all of God's promises for salvation are coming true. And so as Jesus, as Jesus progresses, as his, his life progresses, progresses through the Gospel of Mark. He, as I said before, he bursts onto the scene. He heals the sick. He undoes the power of death in doing so. He calms storms and controls the chaos of the fallen world. He casts out evil spirits, defeating spiritual satanic evil. And he feeds the hungry, nourishing his people physically and spiritually. This is the salvation that Isaiah announced coming in this man, Jesus Christ. 
And so a little bit later in the Gospel of Mark, about halfway through, Jesus asks his disciples, who do, who do you say I am? And it, it goes like this. Let me read this very famous part of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Remember, John the Baptist was one who came announcing Jesus was coming. John the Baptist had been killed, and so they thought, well, maybe this is another great prophet. John the Baptist come back. Or maybe it's Elijah, that prophet in the Old Testament, who had, who had done so much to bring God's word and was taken up to heaven. Maybe it's him come back to save us, which was the promise of Malachi the prophet. What about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Peter and the disciples, they can see who Jesus is. He is the great prophet, the great Messiah, the saviour of God's people, sent by God himself. And so this is the gospel. Now we're really getting to a, a thick definition of the gospel. It is a gospel of salvation for the world. And it is centred on the person, Jesus Christ. But Jesus has more to say here. Because right after Peter calls him the Messiah, Jesus shifts the script. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's a way of talking about himself, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now, if you're already familiar with this part of the Bible, then you might, it might not seem very surprising. You read it and go, oh, yeah, this is what happens. But when Jesus said this, he would have completely shocked his disciples. This is the first time that Jesus mentions anything about having to suffer and die. And so the disciples are completely blindsided. You, know, you need to understand, remember this, this picture that I've just spent, uh, painting a picture of salvation from the Lord, so much greater than the Roman Empire and everything that Isaiah promised? How could this Saviour, the Lord's Saviour, now suffer and be rejected and killed. Now, I wonder if you have a friend who is always the most enthusiastic person in the room, always the one to come up with the craziest idea, the first to do something rash. Now, among Jesus' disciples, that was Peter. And Peter didn't like hearing Jesus talk like this, and so he rebukes him. And he tells him, tells him off. You can't. What are you doing? We don't have his words. I imagine he would have said something like this. What are you doing, Jesus? You idiot. I, I'm, that's a, he might have said that. I would never say that. <laughs> but, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. Whoa, Peter, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus rebukes Peter so harshly because his death is at the center of the gospel that he came to bring. This salvation only can happen by Jesus dying a horrific death as a cursed slave and being raised again to life. Why? Why is that? Why does Jesus have to die that kind of death? We're going to cover this, just like everything else, in a bit more detail this week. But Jesus needed... The issue is that Jesus wasn't just rescuing his people from the Romans. He wasn't just bringing his people back from exile. He wasn't just defeating the evil out there. He also needed to deal with the sin that was in here for each of them and for the nation and deal with the judgment of God for Israel and for all God's people. And it was only possible in this way. So by dying, he absorbs the wrath of God and defeated sin and death. 
And by rising to life again, he brings forgiveness and new life and hope for the world. And so the gospel of salvation that's centered on Jesus Christ only comes through his death and resurrection. And so it's at this point that we can give a summary of the gospel as we see it unfold in the gospel of Mark. And so this is my definition of the gospel uh, for this week. The gospel is the announcement that Jesus is the Lord who brings salvation for his people through his death and resurrection. And what we've seen as we've gone through is that all of this is according to the Old Testament scriptures. Particularly Isaiah is what we've seen tonight. Now I want to pause and ask you here, how does this compare with your picture, your mental picture of the gospel? I think often our picture of the gospel can just focus on one aspect and lose the others. Now, where I'm from, sometimes we can so focus on the gospel as Jesus' death and resurrection. I, I'm sure you know the type. The, the, the cross is the center of everything. Every sermon has to mention the cross. Every song has to be about the blood of Jesus. Now, the problem with just focusing on this is that you lose the big picture. You can forget that this, is a, this gospel is about a person, about Jesus Christ, who calls us to worship him and follow him. And you, you can forget this is part of a big story that's not just about forgiving sins, but also restoring the whole of creation. Another possibility is that's not... You can focus on the cross, but another possibility is to focus on the gospel as salvation. The gospel is that God has come to save me. He's delivered me. He's forgiven me and released me and given me freedom in my life. He forgives my sin and leads me to eternal life. Now, The problem with just focusing on this, on this salvation, is that it, become, it can become all about me and my needs, or, or us and our needs, but it becomes about my forgiveness, my fulfillment, the difference it makes to our life now, the difference it makes to our community, the difference it makes to our world. And it misses that the gospel is not a gospel about me. It's not a gospel about us. It's about Jesus Christ. And it can downplay the significance and seriousness and cost of his death. And so you could also potentially focus on just the gospel as following Jesus. Why do we have to talk about, about sins and, and about the cross all the time? Let's just focus on following Jesus. That it's just about living as a simple disciple, walking in his steps and following his ways. The problem here is that you lose the need for salvation. Jesus becomes merely a wise teacher and giver of advice. But we need not a, just a teacher and a friend... We need a saviour. So my point is this. If you want to understand the gospel, you need to hold these things all together. We need to hold these aspects together. Christ, the cross, salvation. Together they give us a rich, expansive vision of the gospel. Just one of them is not enough. We need to hold them together. So tonight it's worth asking yourself, which of these aspects do you tend to downplay? And how will you remedy that? Okay, so we have our summary of the gospel. The announcement that Jesus is the Lord who brings salvation for his people through his death and resurrection. And that this is according to the Old Testament scriptures. But it's not just in Mark that we see this. We see a very similar pattern in Matthew and in Luke. Don't worry, I'm not about to take us all the way through Matthew and Luke. Uh, We don't have time to look at those tonight. But we also see it in Paul, a very similar pattern in the Apostle Paul. So let me just take you to two passages, one quick one and one a little bit longer, where we're going to see this same pattern of the gospel. And the first is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. 
And like the beginning of Mark, Paul focuses again here on Christ the Lord. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The gospel that Paul proclaims in really the shortest summary of the gospel I think you'll find anywhere is that Jesus is Lord. If you want a condensed three-word version of the gospel, that's it. And uh, it's there to show that it's about Jesus Christ as the Lord then who reveals God to us. We see God's glory in his face and so brings the salvation that we need. And now I think this short summary really puts, you know, I talked about having Christ, salvation and the cross as those kind of three aspects. I think it really puts an underline under Christ as, look, if you don't have this at the center of your gospel, then something is seriously wrong. Something has gone terribly wrong. So much of our religion and even our Christianity can be centered on ourselves. Our fulfillment, our knowledge, even our ministry, our mission in the world, our living well. But at the center of Christianity is Jesus as the Lord, says Paul. But it's in the book of Romans that Paul summarizes his gospel in the most detail. Well, he doesn't summarize it, does he? Uh, Paul outlines his gospel uh, in the most detail. The book of Romans is perhaps the most influential piece of literature in the world. Paul lays out his gospel in detail for all to see. And so from the earliest days of Christianity, Romans was the central book for believers. The great philosopher and theologian, St. Augustine, drew heavily from Romans when he outlined his understanding of grace. So did Martin Luther at the beginning of the Reformation. And the book of Romans and the theology of the gospel for all the world was the part of the basis for missionary movements through history that brought the gospel even as far as Malaysia, even Australia. Because it's about a gospel that goes to the world. But it's in the first chapter of Romans that Paul summarizes his gospel. So let's look at that together in the first six verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll stop there. Now, what I want you to see in these verses is that we get the same concepts that we had in Mark. First, in verse 2, the gospel was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, as in Mark, where the gospel began with the announcement of Isaiah, so here the gospel is promised according to the Old Testament Scriptures. And that's not just a throwaway line that Paul leaves behind. The rest of the book of Romans, if you go away and read it, which I recommend you do, if you go away and read the book of Romans, you'll see it's an exposition of the gospel that again and again is about how the gospel fulfills Old Testament expectations. The Scriptures are the origin of the gospel. And then in verse 3, this gospel concerns his son. It's concerning his son. Here again, this Christological, this Christ center of the gospel, the announcement that the, of the person, Jesus Christ, is Lord. Paul teases this out a little bit now, and he puts it a little differently to, uh, as he puts it in, in 2 Corinthians. It's a little different because on the one hand, he says that Jesus is descended, in verse 3, descended from David according to the flesh. And his point there, I think, is that Jesus is a human Lord, descended from the great King David. But on the other hand, in verse 4, was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. He is the divine Lord, the divine Son of God. God. 
resurrected and enthroned and seated with his Father on high. I often get young people ask me, uh, why, what's the point of, resurre- of the resurrection? You know, Jesus died, my sins are forgiven. Why did he rise again? What's the point? Was it a clever trick? Was it something to prove that Jesus' death worked? Or was it just you know, a happy ending to make it a more inspiring story? Jesus' resurrection is so much more than those things. It declares him to be not just a mere human king, but the divine Lord ascended on high. Now, these opening verses are a strong Christological summary of the gospel. It's very powerful, too, because it takes our eyes off ourselves and fixes us on him to trust and obey him. But then a little bit later on, Paul takes a slightly different perspective on the gospel. And in verse 16, he summarizes the gospel not in terms of Christ, but in terms of our salvation. Just as in Mark, the gospel is an announcement of salvation. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is the gospel that brings salvation to all who believe. But what is salvation for Paul? Well, he goes on. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. One thing I love about my kids is that they demand that everything be fair. When I say love, you know, I, <laughs> I love my kids. But sometimes when they demand when everything's fair all the time, like, come on, guys, not every, life isn't always fair. They demand that everyone takes a turn cleaning the table after dinner. That they all get turns choosing what to watch. Everyone gets the exact same size piece of chocolate cake. Now, this inherent sense of justice is ingrained deeply into each of us. We want things to be fair. And not just fair, we want things to be put right. Wrong things to be put right. And so when Paul says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, it is another way of saying that the justice of God is revealed. Salvation for Paul means that everything will be put right. Wrongs will be righted. The wicked punished and the righteous vindicated. Now, on the one hand, God will put things right in the world. Isaiah promised that a lot. But on the other hand, God will allow the wicked to become righteous. Through faith in Christ, even the wicked, that is all humanity, will be considered righteous and made right with God. There is a lot to unpack there. And if you want to know more, you can talk about it afterwards. We'll go and read Romans 3, 21 to 26. So Paul, the gospel for Paul involves salvation for God's people, salvation for the world by making things right again. And so... We have now, I think, a pretty good idea of the summary of the gospel in the New Testament. If we're looking at the gospels and we're looking at Romans, that it is the announcement that Jesus is the Lord who brings salvation and put things right in the world through his death and resurrection, and that this is according to the Old Testament scriptures. Now, I hope now that we have a clearer sense of the gospel in the New Testament But we're here, as I said, not just to talk... You might be going, hey, us, we're supposed to be talking about the Old Testament. And we will. So the question remains, what does the Old Testament have to do with the Gospel? Well, as we come to answer this second question, I want you to see a tension here. That there is, in the Gospel, there is something both old and new. We've already seen what Mark and Paul said... The gospel was according to the scriptures. We hear scriptures, we think of the whole Bible. Uh, But when in the New Testament speaks about the scriptures, you need to remember this is what we call the Old Testament. But we've also seen the gospel is something new. It's not just the Old Testament. Jesus erupts into the world proclaiming the kingdom of God and forgiveness of sins. This is groundbreaking, unlike anything like it. In Jesus, God is revealing himself himself. 
in a fresh and new way. So how do these things relate, the new and the old? Now, one solution would be to get rid of the old and just stick with the new. This is how our consumer culture does things. If I get a new car, I don't keep the old one. If I sell, I sell it, I drive a new one. If I get a new shirt, I throw out the old one. Marcion was a Christian who lived about 150 years after Jesus was born. And he decided that the gospel was so new and so important that he would throw out the old. Throw out the Old Testament scriptures altogether. He taught that the God of the Old Testament was actually a different God. That it was the creator God uh, that was only vengeful and jealous. He was a tribal God who had physical characteristics, physical body like the other gods in ancient myths. This God was obsessed with law and judgment and demanded fear and obedience. But on the other hand, in the New Testament, so Marcion thought, it was a different God. This was the saviour God who was compassionate and loving and merciful. This God taught us to have faith and love. And this God saved the souls of humanity from the corrupted created, from the corrupted creator God. So for Marcion, it's like the New Testament saves us from the Old Testament. And so we should Stop following the angry, earthly, Old Testament God and instead follow the good spiritual God of the New Testament. That's what Marcion said. And he created his own Bible that was just really the teachings of Jesus and Paul without half the New Testament too. Now, it's easy for us to kind of stand here and think, oh, that's crazy, we'd never do such a thing. But in practice, I think many of us Christians can be a bit like Marcion. And we follow Jesus, we love him, we love his teachings, we love mercy and grace, we love the spiritual and we love the peaceful, the clear teaching in the New Testament, all that, all that good stuff. But the problem comes when we then downplay or even ignore the old. I think we do this when we read the Bible for ourselves and we just kind of read the familiar bits at the back. And even in church, I was listening to uh, just the other day to a churchgoer say to me the other day, oh, I just read the Gospels. And we do it when we just study our favourite topics or even our favourite New Testament books at church again and again and, and leave out Genesis and Joshua and the Psalms and Habakkuk. And so this week, my challenge to you is don't be like Marcion. That was the wrong way to go. Don't do that. The God of the Old Testament is the very same God who is revealed by Jesus Christ in the New. The difference is that now we see him even more clearly, but he's still the same God. And so let me just show you a crucial Old Testament text where we see God's gospel character proclaimed clearly and straightforwardly. In Exodus 34, Israel had been unfaithful again, but God had been incredibly gracious. And he then appears to Moses and proclaims his character in some words that reverberate again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Well, it keeps going. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation? Did you hear that description of God? I think especially that first part can be a bit surprising for some Christians. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving. But yes, he is also holy and just and he judges the wicked. But it's the same picture in the New Testament. We know, I mean, we know that God in the New Testament is gracious and forgiving, but like Exodus 34, he's also holy and just. You know, no one speaks more about hell in the Bible than Jesus himself himself. 
And so my point is this. We can't let Marcion have his way. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God in the New Testament. And his gospel character of merciful justice carries out through the Bible from the first page to the last. And so if Marcion is wrong, how should we relate the Old Testament and the gospel? Well, the last passage I want to take you to is uh, we, we can go there to hear what Jesus says about the issue. Luke 24 is the final chapter of Luke's biography of Jesus. And in this chapter, the disciples, they start out being really confused about Jesus. But it's only when Jesus explains the Old Testament to them that they actually understand him and his gospel. Now, at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, the appearance of Jesus was obviously very good news. At his birth, his mother Mary and his uncle Zechariah and uh, the prophet Simeon, they all prophesied that he was the saviour. And when he grew up, everyone was amazed at his miracles and teaching. When he called his disciples, they gave up everything and followed him. This is a clear gospel from Jesus already. But the religious leaders hated Jesus. They ambushed him, rejected him, and executed him. And at this point, this did not look like good news. It looked like Caesar was Lord as he died on that Roman cross, not Jesus. But at the beginning of chapter 24, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James... They went to prepare Jesus' body further for burial. But the tomb was open and Jesus' body was gone. And suddenly two angels appeared and told them, He's not here, he's risen. Now the women, they saw this and they were completely baffled. They didn't know what to make of it. So they go to the other disciples, they tell them what happened. And the other disciples, they don't believe it. As far as they're concerned, Jesus is dead. There's no gospel here. Now later, a couple of disciples, they're walking to a village called Emmaus, talking together about everything that had happened, struggling to work it out. What has happened to Jesus? We thought he was different. We thought he was the saviour we needed. We thought he was the good news we needed. He can't have been raised from the dead. That's ridiculous. But while they're talking, Jesus himself appears to them. But they're kept from recognising him. They don't know who he is. What are you talking about, he said. They told Jesus about Jesus. Would have been a bit of a strange conversation for Jesus. Uh, Told told Jesus about Jesus of Nazareth, this great prophet they hoped would redeem Israel, but who who was killed by the religious leaders. Some women claimed he was alive, but, you know, we can't really trust women. It's what they thought then. They didn't know what to believe. The disciples were struggling to make sense of it all. But pay attention because what Jesus says next unlocks it all for them. And look at how he does it in verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning him himself. The disciples didn't understand, but Jesus made them understand. And, it, you know, Jesus could have said, uh, oh foolish ones, how slow of heart to believe. Look, it's me. Let me tell you, just on my own authority, why it is that I had to die and rise again. But he doesn't do that. He says, you haven't understood the scriptures. He makes them understand the gospel only by opening the Old Testament to them. Everything they needed to know about him was there all along. And so this is how the old and the new relate. That you cannot understand the gospel of the New Testament if you do not understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the key to understanding the gospel. Now, how can that be true? Now, I want to ask you, when you hear that the Old Testament reveals the gospel, what do you think of? What do you think of? Which parts of the Old Testament come to mind? 
Now, I'll bet for many of you, if you, if you think of any parts of the Old Testament, it might be a, it's probably a few famous prophecies. Maybe from, uh, maybe from Isaiah 7 that looks forward to the Emmanuel or God with us. Or Daniel 7, sorry, that's Isaiah 11. Or Daniel 7, who promises the one like the Son of Man. Or Isaiah 9, that promises a mighty king. But there's so much more going on here than just a few isolated prophecies. Because look again at verse 27. It's beginning with Moses and all the prophets that he interpreted to them in all the, all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus began with Moses. And that's the first five books of the Bible, uh, otherwise called the Law or the Torah or the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Even those books point us to the gospel of Jesus. Not even even, especially those books point us to the gospel of Jesus. Adam and Eve in the garden. The old man, Father Abraham. Exodus from Egypt, the Ten Commandments, all those laws about sacrifice, the unclean animals, religious festivals, living life in the land, they all speak in some way about the gospel of Jesus. But it doesn't stop there because he also says, mentions the prophets. And when it says the prophets, he's not just talking about the prophetic oracles that we're used to thinking of. Jewish tradition has always used the term prophets to refer to the historical books of the Old Testament that we think of as uh, Joshua to two kings, as well as all the other prophets that we know, you know, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Joel, etc. Even that story of Israel in the land and the rise of the kingdom and the fall into exile and the rest of the prophets speaks of the gospel of Jesus. We've got Moses, we've got the prophets, and it doesn't stop there. Because if you jump ahead to verse 44, he says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And now we have the Psalms. And when Jesus says Psalms here, he's probably using it as a shorthand for that third great division in the Hebrew Scriptures of the writings which included the Psalms, but also other biblical books like Esther and Ruth and Nehemiah and the wisdom books. His point is that even all these speak about the gospel of Jesus. So this isn't just a few isolated prophecies here and there. This is all of the Old Testament scriptures from which the palette of, of Jesus and the gospel is painted. But I still haven't really explained how this works, but over the course of the week... We're going to see this in some more detail. But I'm just going to mention briefly the ways that we see the gospel in the Old Testament. And the first is that we see the God of the gospel. I've already taken you to Exodus 34 that proclaims God's good character. And so we see the God of the gospel through the Old Testament in Israel's prayers, the Psalms, the songs as they praise God for his loving, gracious character. Second, we see the gospel enacted and present as God actually saves his people. Now, tomorrow, we're going to look in more detail at the Exodus. Before the Exodus, God's people were enslaved and living under the power of sin and death, and through it, God saves his people from that power. And then later, God's people are stuck in in exile. And God proclaims that he will save them and he restores them. And we see God actually saving his people. Instances of the gospel being enacted. So we see the God of the gospel, we see the gospel enacted. We also see the gospel patterned. And what I mean mean is this, is that when God enacts the gospel, it actually sets up patterns of salvation that repeat throughout the Old Testament and then come to a climax in Jesus Christ. These are also called types or figures. And these are people or institutions or events that progressively build and give us a picture that's fulfilled in Jesus. And so, for example, at the Exodus, it set up a pattern for how God saves and help us to understand the gospel of Jesus as a kind of pattern of an exodus. Exodus. 
Another example is animal sacrifice. You know, these strange, gruesome practices were a pattern of God dealing with sin. The blood cleanses us from sin and turns away God's anger. And then this pattern is fulfilled when Jesus' death is a sacrifice. It's a pattern, it's a type. In the Old Testament, the gospel is... is uh, we see God's character, we see it enacted, we see it patterned. And finally, we see the gospel promised. And all the way back from God's promises to Abraham to restore the creation by making him a great nation, giving him great descendants and a land and blessing, to God's promises to David uh, that his kingdom would last forever, to God's promises through his prophets that a great king would come and bring renewal to the world. We see the gospel promised. And so what we'll be looking at this week, well, remember our definition, the announcement that Jesus is the Lord who brings salvation and puts things right through his death and resurrection. And this is according to the scriptures. Now, if you take those four parts, you can break them down like this. We've got the who is the, God, the who of the gospel. Jesus is the Lord. The what of the gospel. He brings salvation and puts things right in the world. The how of the gospel, through his death and resurrection. And the origin of the gospel, that this is according to the Old Testament scriptures. Now tonight, we have really looked at and covered the origin of the gospel, that this is according to the Old Testament scriptures. But over the next few nights, we're going to take those other three elements and rearrange them, and uh, just for pedagogical purposes, and uh, look at their Old Testament origins as we go. And... So it's going to look like, look like this. Tomorrow, the what of the Old Testament gospel? Salvation through the Exodus. The how of the Old Testament gospel? Through death and resurrection. And the who of the Old Testament gospel? The prophetic, priestly, royal son of man. I'm really looking forward to this. And I hope you are too. And I hope that you'll join me. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus. And we ask that you would help us to keep it central in our minds and hearts in all its richness and fullness. And we pray that you'd be with us this week as we continue to explore and see how the the grace, your grace and your gospel is shown to us through our Lord Jesus Christ, even and especially in the Old Testament scriptures. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.